Ideal gases can be a really tricky topic at A-level physics, especially if you don't do A-level chemistry. So in today's video, we're going to look at some of the assumptions behind ideal gases um, and some of the gas laws, and then look at the ideal gas equation and what we can derive from it. So quite often, um, you'll see in textbooks this phrase kinetic theory. Um, so that just means using the idea of particles to explain properties of a gas, which is a relatively new thing. The properties were discovered first, and then we explained it using particles or molecules afterwards. Now, particles in a gas move in in what's called Brownian motion, which has been observed in smoke particles um, and also in pollen particles. The idea is that smoke particles were seen to be moving even without anything else visibly being near them, um, and that's due to there being invisible air molecules near them, um, exerting a force on them, moving them left, right, up and down in a random motion, um, so they're bombarded by invisible air particles and not by the wind or anything else that's there. This can also be viewed in liquids, so pollen grains, which are um, kind of uh, very small but not invisible grains in liquid, um, which can be seen to move in the same way. So this leads us on to our assumptions behind gas particles then. So the first assumption we're going to look at um, is that the particles themselves are infinitesimally small. So what that means is that they have a negligible volume compared to the volume of the total gas or the container they're in. Sometimes that's called point molecules. So the volume is negligible compared to the container assumption um, is that there are no electrostatic forces uh, between the molecules or between the particles. And now if you study A-level chemistry you'll know a little bit about this, about polar molecules and London forces. Uh, we just don't worry about that at all at A-level physics. Particles are moving in continual random motion, um, so kind of left, right, up, down, different range of speeds um, and every collision they um, are involved in is elastic. Um, so that could be with other particles or with a container wall. That means all kinetic energy um, is conserved um, and not lost due to heat and things like that and our last assumption is that a collision time or time for a collision is very small compared to the time taken to travel from kind of one side of the container to another. This will be really important when we look at a derivation um, later in the video. Now integral to the idea of gases is that gas pressure. So we can look at how is pressure exerted in a gas. Now this is all about the interactions between particles or molecules and the walls of a container, not each other. So let's say we have a particle with a mass m and initial speed u um, entering into a container. Um, it rebounds off in an elastic collision and it rebounds with a velocity u. So how do we work out the force that it exerts? Well, we'd use the equation force equals change of momentum divided by change in time. Now, overall, the change of momentum, it goes in with mu, it comes out with minus mu because it's traveling in the opposite direction. That gives us a total of 2 mu, so the force would be 2 mu divided by any change in time. So therefore, that has to be a non-zero value, so there must be a force when the particle hits the container. So in words, what you'd say is you'd say pressure is exerted in the gas when there is a change of momentum when a particle collides with a container wall. Um, you could say due to a change in direction of the particle. Therefore, there's a force exerted, and you can quote the equation here. That's always a good idea. Um, and how does that link to pressure? Well, we should know that pressure is equal to force divided by area. So if there's a force on a certain area, therefore there's going to be a pressure by each particle colliding, so an overall pressure on the container. So how can we increase that pressure um, inside a gas? There are a couple of ways on how to do this. Way number one is to increase the temperature of the gas. So if we increase the temperature of the gas, um, what that means is that the particles or the molecules have an increased kinetic energy. Um, and this is just about particles, not the gas overall. It's not moving anywhere. Um, so increased kinetic energy means more frequent collisions, more collisions per second, and also greater force because the velocity has increased as well. As well as um, using the temperature to change the pressure, we could decrease the volume. Now, decreasing the volume uh, would mean that there are more frequent collisions because there's a decreased time between collisions. So there's more collisions per second, meaning a greater overall force, um, meaning a greater pressure because pressure equals force divided by area. Now, these relationships between pressure and other factors um, are known as gas laws. So the first one, um, which is the first bullet point here, is how pressure relates to temperature, um, which is called the pressure law or the Gay-Lussac law. And it says that pressure is proportional to temperature if the volume is constant and the mass of the gas is constant. Um, so if I was to plot a graph of um, pressure versus temperature in Kelvin, it'd be directly proportional going straight through the origin. 
Um, next is the relationship between pressure and volume. Um, so this is known as Boyle's law. Um, so Boyle's law states that um, we said if you decrease the volume, the pressure goes up. So that means that pressure is inversely proportional to volume um, if the temperature is constant and if it's a constant mass of the gas as well. So to plot that in a graph, um, you'd have uh, pressure and volume would look like a curve like this, which you could prove by replotting as pressure is directly proportional to a one over volume graph. There's one more gas law you need to know about, that's Charles's law, which isn't to do with pressure, and um, pressure is constant, um, then the volume of the gas is directly proportional to the temperature. Um, and again, we've got the same uh, or constant mass of the gas. Uh, so that then gives us a graph of um, volume uh, being directly proportional to temperature if it's in Kelvin, um, and volume is usually measured in meters cubed. How can we use these relationships in calculations? Well, um, volume is equal to a constant times by T, uh, the temperature, therefore V over T is equal to a constant. So V1 over T1 initially is equal to V2 over T2 finally. So you should have three of those values, find the missing one by using that relationship. It's the same thing with pressure and temperature, P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. And pressure and volume, if you multiply them together, that would be a constant. So therefore pressure one times volume one equals pressure two times by volume two. Now, combining these three relationships together, uh, we can come up with an overall uh, relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature, which is that if I multiply P by V divided by T, that is equal to a constant. And I could do the same thing here. I could say P1 times V1 divided by T1 equals P2 times V2 divided by T2. Now, this constant um, does have a value, and we're going to use it um, in uh, uh, coming up with the ideal gas equation. So PV over T equals N, which is the number of moles of the gas, multiplied by the molar gas constant, which is 8.31, and obviously you'll be in your equation sheet. Um, so that's the constant there. Uh, you'll see this equation usually rewritten um, slightly differently as PV equals NR times T. This equation only works if pressure is in pascals, volume is in meters cubed, um, number of moles is in moles um, and the temperature's got to be in Kelvin so add 273 to it if it's given to you in degrees because absolute zero is minus 273. What if you wanted to find out the overall number of particles um, in a sample of a gas, uh, capital N? So what you need to know is the number of moles of the gas, and then you need to know how many particles are in one mole. Now, this number is Avogadro's constant, which you should recognize from GCSE or A-level chemistry. Um, and it's given by 6.02 times 10 to the power 23. Now, rearranging it, we can then say um, the number of moles is equal to the number of particles divided by Avogadro's number. So I can replace the N, a small case N, in the ideal gas equation with those two terms. Um, and what we might notice, I've now got two constants in my equation. So I'm going to draw out the capital N and have those two constants divide by each other. So R over NA times by T. Now these two constants divide by each other. Um, 8.31 divided by 6.02 times 10 to the power 23 um, equals 1.38 times 10 to the power minus 23. Um, and this is a constant known as bolt constant so it gets its own name gets its own symbol uh, which is the letter k and again it's on your equation sheet and um, you just got to make sure you reach the right equation um, with the right constant at each time so this one you use if you want to know the number of particles or your given number of particles so these two equations together, um, PV equals uh, small case N R times T and PV equals capital N times KT um, are known as the ideal gas equation. So you're given them both, make sure you know which one to use in each instant. Um, now there can be an extra twist, which is um, questions involving molar mass, um, which is gonna really take you back to GCSE chemistry um, if you're not studying A-level. Molar mass, as the name suggests, is essentially the mass of one mole of a substance, which would be different for different substances. Um, so for example, one mole of a mass would be 12 grams of carbon 12. Um, on the other hand, it would be 32 grams of oxygen 16, because oxygen um, it has two atoms in a molecule, giving you a total atomic weight of 32, so it'd be 32 grams. Okay, so notice the pattern here. Um, the way we define it with in terms of physics is we say it's the mass of 12 grams of carbon-12. That's because carbon-12 um, is an incredibly stable isotope, so we've used that um, for the last couple of centuries to define what one um, mole weighs. So we use that to define what the mass of one mole is. So using this expression and the molar mass m, um, if I wanted to find that out, I'd need to know the number of moles and the total mass of the substance to find out the mass of one mole. So if I know the number of moles and I know the mass of the overall substance, I can divide them to find the molar mass. 
So why is this useful? Uh, well, if I have the molar mass, um, I can use it to find out the number of moles. So the molar mass of a substance is equal to the total mass divided by the number of moles. Now, then I can use this if I wanted to put it into my ideal gas equation and say number of moles equals the mass of the substance divided by the molar mass, that can tell me n, so I can input it into my equation. Um, so that little expression is not given to you in your equation sheet. My top tip is to try and look at units if you can. So the molar mass is in kilograms per mole, um, so mass divided by number of moles so it'll help you keep an eye on well what is it and how do I find the number of moles or moles um, to put into my equation Next, what we're going to look at is one of the hardest derivations you could find in year 13 physics. Uh, but it comes up and it's good use of uh, applying different parts of physics and the topics um, to ideal gases. So we're driving this expression here. Let me talk about that last term, CRMS. Now, if I try and find the average velocity of a bunch of particles, no matter what speed they're going at, because they're all going in different directions, their velocity average um, will equal zero because um, they'll all cancel out. So we use a different type of average called a root mean square speed. Um, now, now that comes up in um, magnetic fields when you look at um, kind of current and RMS current and RMS voltage as well. How you work it out is you square the values, then you add them, then you find the mean, then you square root. So you kind of do what it says there, but do it in reverse. So you square it, then you mean it, then you square root it. Um, so our derivation, um, we're going to consider a sample of a gas um, moving, um, well, one particle moving first of all, um, and we're going to try and derive this equation. So follow along each step, get your pen and paper ready, and let's dive in. So this particle has a mass m and has initial velocity u. Um, so as we covered briefly before, the force of a particle when it um, hits a wall will be equal to mu divided by t. Now, um, once we consider that first particle, um, we are only considering one direction. However, um, let's say we have a three-dimensional container like a cube, we have to consider three dimensions. So the number of particles we're talking about is only a third of the overall particles that are in that container because we're just considering one uh, direction. So we say n over three times by our expression for the um, force 2mu over t. Now, um, I'm going to draw out um, that 1 over t uh, for reasons I'll explain in a second, um, and everything else stays the same. Let's combine the n over 3 with the 2mu um, together. So um, the 1 over t is going to become important because we're going to look at how to work out the velocity of the particle. So let's say the length of the cube is L. Um, the time taken, um, so speed equals distance over time, time equals distance over velocity. Uh, the distance travelled between one side of the cube and the other is 2L over V. Rearranging this, uh, what for 1 over t, I flip the fraction, it becomes V over 2L. So therefore I replace this into my value from earlier for 1 over t. So therefore I've got V over 2L times by my expression from earlier, 2m u divided by 3. All right, I hope you're following along so far. Um, that's the bulk of the work done for now, and um, we'll be pleased to know. Um, so what we're going to do is just combine those expressions together. I've got two v's, so I've got now I've got v squared, um, and I've got two on the top and the bottom, so those two cancel, and I've got force equals nm v squared divided by 3l. So um, in the derivation, we're trying to look for pressure. Now, pressure equals force over area. Um, now, the area of the cube, uh, the length is L, so the area is L squared. So force equals pressure times by length squared. So I'm going to substitute that instead of the force um, on the left-hand side, and the right-hand side stays the same. But we can simplify things down, because I've got L squared on one side, and I've got L on another. So if I divide both sides by L squared, now I've got 3L cubed um, on the bottom of my expression. Now, L cubed, we should know, um, if I've got length times length times length, that's the same thing as saying the volume of the uh, cube. So therefore, I can rewrite it, P equals NMV squared over 3 times the volume, capital V. Rearranging a little bit, um, and now I've got PV on one side, a third on the other side, and instead of V squared, I'm just going to use that um, expression RMS speed um, squared, but nothing's really changed apart from that, and that's the derivation um, for that equation. Now, some questions can be really sneaky and ask you about or ask you to calculate the density um, of a gas. So how do we involve density in this expression? Um, now, we know density is mass over volume. Um, now, little m here is the mass of a molecule, and n is the number of particles. So the total mass of the gas is given by capital N times by little m, the mass of one molecule. So if I bring the volume expression over to the right, I've now got density equals mass over volume. Now, this what's remaining in the equation is um, we've got a third, um, sorry, big one, a three over to the other side 3p over uh, root mean squared speed um, so that's how you could find the density if you're given for example the pressure and the speed
Okay, final derivation um, for this one is the last expression you'll find in your equation sheet, uh, which is looking at this equation on the right hand side here, uh, which is that the average kinetic energy, um, half mv squared, is equal to 3 over 2 kT, where T is the temperature of the gas and K is Boltzmann's constant. So we're going to use our ideal gas equation from earlier and the equation we've just derived, combine them together to prove this is the case. So you notice we've got PV on both equations, so we can then equate together the right hand side. So Nm root mean squared speed squared equals NKT. So the first thing we should notice um, is I've got uh, an N on both sides, so I can cancel that later nice and easily. Um, that's straightforward. It's the same capital N for both. And if I multiply both sides by 3 over 2, I have the same expression. It's on the right-hand side of the thing I'm trying to derive, which is 3 over 2 kT. Now, multiplying the left-hand side by 3 over 2, 3 over 2 times a third um, is going to cancel down to 1 over 2, um, which is the half we're looking for, M times by root mean squared speed over 2, um, root mean squared speed. Um, now, this is the average kinetic energy of a molecule. So you could be asked this question and you could be given the mass and the root mean squared speed um, or you could be given the temperature. Either side of the equation is both the average kinetic energy of a molecule. However, and the right hand side is easier to use. Um, now on the equation sheet, it also has it R over Na just means the same thing means K and the Boltzmann constant. We can use that to find the average kinetic energy. All right, so well done uh, for getting to the end of that derivation. Um, make sure you understand each part and make sure you comply with exam questions um, as well.